All right. Well, I have 301. And so to be conscientious of everyone's time, I'll go ahead and get us started this afternoon. Welcome, everyone. My name is Hannah Kelly, and I'm a registered dietitian with the American Dairy Association here in Indiana. It's my pleasure to welcome you all today on behalf of our staff and our friends at the Ball State University College of Health. Today's webinar, Creating a Sustainable Society, How Inspired Thinking, Innovation, and Entrepreneurial Spirit Will Change the Planet, is the second in a series of three sessions designed to open discussion and share knowledge in areas um, that are common to all of us. Sustainability of our planet is certainly one of those areas. So sustainability is a subjective term, meaning something different and personal to everyone. Essentially, sustainability is something that can be maintained, um, but it's most often aligned with environmental safety these days and the health of our planet. Um, but it also uh, encompasses economic and social viability as well. So today we will hear from three incredible professionals, each an expert in their particular field. I'm gonna take a few moments just to give some introductory bio information for you and then we'll get started. First up today, we will hear from Robert Kester. Uh, he is a tenured professor of architecture at Ball State University, teaching design for sustainability in multiple educational settings. He's the founding director of the Academy for Sustainability for Center for Energy Research, Education and Service, the CERES at Ball State University. And he's the founding chair of the Council on the Environment, which continues to serve as a clearinghouse for campus-wide sustainability implementation. He's presented internationally on sustainability education, research and service, and has been published extensively. Next up, we will hear from Erin Fitzgerald. Uh, she serves as the CEO of the U.S. Farmers and Ranchers in Action, uh, which is an organization that represents farmers, ranchers, and food and agricultural partners who share a common vision to further our global sustainable food systems. Prior to USFRA, Erin uh, served as Senior Vice President of Global Sustainability for the Inter Innovation Center for U.S. Dairy, where she conducted an environmental impact assessment that led to an industry-wide voluntary carbon reduction goal of 25% by 2020. And there's more work still happening today <laughs> in that area as well. Um, Last but certainly not least, we will hear from Sam Miller. He is the Director of Undergraduate Studies for Innovation and Entrepreneurship and an Associate Teaching Professor at the University of Notre Dame's Mendoza College of Business, uh, teaching coursework in entrepreneurship and strategic foresight at the undergraduate and graduate teaching levels. Sam is the founder and president of Provoyant Corporation, a strategic foresight and innovation consultancy that provides training and exploratory research for companies and organizations seeking to understand and, and act upon emerging opportunities. So just as a note for reference for everyone today, we have applied for continuing education uh, credits for registered dietitians for this program. And for any attendees who are interested in submitting for continuing ed credits in architecture from the AIA or the ASLA, I would be happy to provide a letter or documents that you may need to apply for after the fact. This program is being recorded and it will be sent out to all of the rest registrants and with contact information for myself, should you need to get in touch with me um, or any additional questions that you may have afterwards. So now without further ado, please welcome Bob Kester. Thanks very much, Hannah. Let me uh, share my screen and uh, see if we can get this uh, working. Uh, <clears throat> hopefully, Is that working, Hannah? I just see your notes, Bob, so you'll have to switch to the other screen. Okay. Stop sharing and share again. <clears throat> How about that? Perfect. Okay, great. 
So thanks for being here with us today. It's going to be fun to uh, go through this material and learn from one another. Uh, I look forward to hearing my two co-presenters here soon. I'm going to walk through a series of uh, slides that talk about sustainability through the lens of a design architect. Uh, I'll be presenting to you four broad categories of content here. Lead, well, LBC, and biophilia or biophilic design. LEAD stands for the Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. Uh, WELL is a, uh, an initiative to evaluate the uh, impact of buildings on human health. LBC stands for Living Building Challenge, which we'll talk about in some detail. And then I'm going to end with a series of slides that show illustrations of biophilic design uh, in action. Uh, sustainability, of course, uh, is a way of reflecting on our history. Uh, our country is 200 and some years old. At one point in time, Manhattan Island looked like you see on the right with a few smoke uh, plumes coming from uh, American Indian uh, settlements. Manhattan today is very different. Uh, we've had a huge impact on the environment. And uh, the question is, can we sustain that over the long haul? And the answer is not if we continue doing some things the way we have been. So there's a lot of pressure and interest in trying to find new ways of making buildings, uh, modifying uh, urban settlement and uh, finding a way for these places that we design and build to be very healthy to occupants and uh, whether we're living, working or playing in these uh, spaces. There's a number of different ways we can talk about how to measure or define sustainability. You see a graph here that shows from left to right buildings that basically meet code. And again, I'm looking at all this through the lens of an architect. Buildings that meet code, buildings that have uh, better practices, buildings that try to achieve high performance in which we get the lead rating um, and the ratings can be certified. A building can be a silver building or a gold building, meaning that it's quite energy efficient and does some good things with material use. Or we can go further and get a lead platinum, which has to do with the sourcing of energy on site and actually going off grid to some degree. And then uh, the living building challenge pushes the envelope even more fully by asking that not only will the building be net zero energy, but also net zero water and net zero waste. And then ultimately the long term is for buildings to become positive contributors to the environment. So can buildings give back more than they take? That's the mantra that we use in our studio teaching. Buildings have huge impact on the environment, uh, water use, greenhouse gas emissions, waste and electricity consumption all represent significant pieces of the pie when you look at the global performance of uh, our world. Um, buildings require a lot to keep themselves going and uh, the users and occupants within buildings drive these values quite strongly. LEED was established a number of years ago to try to put into the marketplace a motive for being more, becoming more sustainable. The leadership in energy and environmental design was set up as a scoring system. Designers of buildings, whether brand new buildings or retrofits of existing buildings could seek to become certified silver, lead, uh, uh, gold, or lead platinum. In doing that, you had to address a number of topical areas, how you worked with the site development, waste, water management, energy management, and so forth. And you got points for innovation and design uh, uh, inspiration. And in the end, uh, there's a score that gets attached to the building, much like we see on the box of cornflakes. It tells you what the uh, metabolism, if you will, is going to be as a result of this building, how it's going to affect the flow of resources on the globe. So that system was put in place about 20 years ago. A, a number of uh, projects now are lead rated. We have a standard at Ball State that all new buildings must be lead silver. So this is widely taken off in the market. And as a result, energy savings, carbon, water, and waste have really been coming down with all these new buildings constructed under the LEED framework. It has positive impact on performance, productivity, and value. The best way to illustrate that is to talk in terms of school, uh, children doing better if they have daylit classrooms, uh, office productivity going up if you have good quality air and uh, 
illumination, uh, increased productivity in factories, increased uh, performance in hospitals with folks getting out of uh, the rooms earlier, recovering more quickly from surgery and such because they have views of nature and uh, they have better healthy air to breathe and uh, temperature control. And then, of course, retail sales. Uh, studies were done that show that a daylit uh, facility will increase sales per square foot compared to an electrically illuminated uh, retail space. In addition to LEED, however, there's another thing called WELL, which is a well building standard that looks at 10 category areas here, uh, air, water, nourishment, and so forth, to try to begin to measure and establish benchmarks for performance. Those are connected back to the um, many systems of the human uh, body. Uh, skeletal is uh, not spelled well, but you get the idea there of the nine, that's the 11 different segments of uh, human con condition that can be evaluated and measured for their performance. And basically, if you have a well building, um, your stress levels are low, your air quality is good, your acoustics are good, and uh, you generally have a more productive environment in which to work or live or play. The uh, points based scoring, again, is a silver, gold, platinum uh, framework. And uh, it's easy to run the numbers and see how well a building is performing. And you can retrofit a building and try to push the level higher. There are a lot of uh, spokespeople for the well standard. You probably see them on some evening television, uh, uh, stars that have been asked to uh, lend their weight to the importance of doing a well building. And many of these have a catch line, which is, I don't enter a building unless it has a well building seal on the window. Uh, <clears throat> the living building challenge is a third area in which you can increase the performance of a building going from basic carbon zero certification, carbon neutrality, all the way <clears throat> to a building that gives back more than it takes. And you're basically climbing a ladder here using a lot of different metrics to establish performance. And the living building challenge has had a big impact. These are all buildings around the country that uh, in fact have been scored and evaluated for being net zero energy, net zero water, net zero waste. They're off grid, they give back more than they take, they export electrons to the grid. And interestingly enough, we have one right here in Indiana, the Cope Environmental Center, project on which the Energy Center here worked with the architects this is one of only 29 buildings in the world that have living building status. And this was just certified um, about a month ago. The following uh, slides, however, will talk about the broader picture of sustainability and ways to evaluate uh, performance in occupied spaces using 14 metrics. Uh, these are called patterns of biophilic design. We know from research that humans have an affinity for nature. We want to be where we can see and observe the changes of the season, the flight of birds, the uh, sounds of birds, and so forth. And so this is all uh, based on <clears throat> these 14 patterns are based on proven research. So this is not just uh, a touchy-feely sort of thing. It's uh, actually scientifically sustainable and scientifically rooted. But there are four, three broad categories, nature in the space, natural analogs, and nature of the space. And as shown on the graph on the right, which you can't read, of course, but uh, it just lists on the very far right the uh, sources of scientific research that backs up the 14 patterns as they're presented. So we'll take a look at the 14 patterns. The first is visual connection with nature. We need to be able to see out. We need to be able to see what's happening around our buildings, whether it's in a court or in a nearby area, like in Japan, where we have the shoji screens that slide them back so that we've got total connectivity to what's going on outdoors. Um, a space with good visual connection feels whole. It can convey a sense of time, weather, and the life of nature. We can also connect with nature acoustically. We can hear the trickling of water or the splashing of water against the edge of uh, a waterfront. Uh, that contributes to our sense of uh, comfort and uh, stability. A third pattern is non-rhythmic sensory stimuli in which we're looking at how um, <clears throat> things in the environment give us a sense of uh, privacy or a sense of specialness. So 
we arrive at a landscape feature outside a building that's quite wonderful, we may want to dwell there for a time. And it's just a place to get away, if you will, while um, you may be working during the day. Another pattern is thermal and airflow variability. Uh, <clears throat> engineers like to make spaces that are uniformly temperate, uh, 72 degrees, 40% humidity, whatever the numbers might be. But we actually like airflow. We like to roll the window down on the car. We like to have breezes come across our skin. So the more that buildings can provide that opportunity, the more comfortable occupants tend to feel. They actually own their space as a result. Presence of water is important, whether it's a, a feature or uh, an adjacency. It could be central to a space. It can be on the periphery, but um, the fluidity and sound and lighting uh, that can connect to that water feature contribute to our sense of well-being. And that can be an important design feature in the making of a building or an urban district. Light quality, whether it's dynamic or diffuse, is very important. We love to know when the sun is being obstructed by cloud cover and passing by. We like to know that it's a bright, brilliant day, or we like to enjoy the diffuse light in a museum where we're looking at paintings that have to be protected from harsh sunlight. So the lighting condition can convey an expression of time and movement, and it evokes these feelings of drama and intrigue and a sense of calm in the spaces that we occupy. Another pattern is connection with the flow of natural systems. Uh, we see things moving, we see things changing. So the four images on the lower left uh, provides you a sense of the four seasons of the year. And of course, that's significant in our sense of nostalgia, relaxation, and uh, we look forward to the changes in the season. Uh, Many of us here in Indiana drive down to Brown County to watch the trees change, right? So that can be an important affinity for a building or an urban location. Another uh, natural affinity we have is for biomorphic form. We like to see nature-like conditions or elements in the geometry and in the ornamentation of a building. And these add to our sense of interest and sense of repose and uh, the fact that the room, or in the case, the stairs on the lower left here are not just a, a mundane thing going to an upper level, but it's an inviting experience. Materiality in the spaces we occupy, whether it's concrete or steel or aluminum or wood, can be pretty significant in our sense of comfort. And so paying attention to how we materialize the interior finishes of a building are necessary in good design. We have an affinity for complexity and order, uh, fractal patterning and repetition of patterns in uh, the making of a building skin or the ornamentation of a building can be very significant in how we feel a sense of order or we read a sense of uh, complexity in our spaces. Being able to see over vast distance is called prospect, whether we're looking out to the ocean at the La Jolla Salk Institute or whether we're looking at an urban garden uh, suburban garden here. Um, being able to get high and look out is, of course, uh, a sense of uh, reinforcement of the quality and character of the climate and the spatial experience. But we also like refuge. We like to be able to call back into the cubby hole, get in a protected area, and avoid uh, the broad scope uh, view. And then finally, we have mystery, which is inviting us to take a trek in the case of the image on the top. Uh, we want to find out what's at the end behind those columns. Uh, we want to find out what's around the hill on the image on the lower left. And risk and peril is a natural thing that we find all throughout nature. Sometimes it's manufactured, if you will, as you see in the lower image on the left. But even a stare in a museum can have that quality of uh, scare and fright as you go up if you stay too close to the rail. Uh, in the end, uh, the idea of biophilia is that we want to connect to nature. We want to have that sense of uh, timelessness or timeliness of the change of seasons. And buildings can be designed so that they not only provide that visual connection, but they also provide the olfactory and the uh, experiential interior space that uh, reinforces uh, our health and uh, human well-being. This building, of course, uh, the last slide, 
is a famous uh, falling water project that Frank Lloyd Wright designed for the Kaufman family. And he did that in 1939. So it's been around a long time. We know what to do. It's time that we move on and get there. And uh, biophilic patterning can be a terrific help in uh, achieving that goal. So that's my quick rundown. Uh, my chance now is to introduce you to Aaron Fitzgerald, who's our next presenter. I am blown away. I can't believe 1939. We might have to, lots of questions even from the panelists. So, <laughs> um, I'm just gonna also try to get my everything up and running here. Are we good? Can you see? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, so we are going to switch gears. And I, th I think what's interesting about your, your last talk was uh, inspiring about people and people based uh, solutions. And you know, I work in agriculture, so that's, and I think about it as agriculture, a culture of people that are really connected to the land. Um, so I keep this, I keep this quote uh, in front of me on my desk. Is that eating is an agricultural act. I know some of my dairy folks, you, you, so we, you might have seen this before, but um, it is really at our dinner tables where we witness the intersection of our cultures, our economies, and the very fabric of our nation. And for agriculture in particular, this is completely wedded to our culture. We use these uh, words of land of milk and honey, a bread basket, amber ways of grain, and blessed and bountiful in many of our song and prose. As a culture of a people, we even have a whole holiday dedicated to honoring the harvest. But what I wanna to talk to you about today is that increasingly, I think our harvest is at risk when it comes to climate change. So um, population times consumption, of course, you guys know this, and this is the, you know, we're fighting for the the amount of land that we can have to that's both in an urban dwelling environment and that is protected by nature and also is available for our growing consumption of, and available for land. Now land is really important to grow, to grow food. Um, if we have 9 billion people coming to dinner by 2050, that's like saying we have to grow as much food as we produce now in the last 8,000 years, in the next 30 years. For any other sector, you can truly imagine that we will have a level of innovation. We can imagine our cell phones and the new types of technology. But in agriculture, as we're working with mother nature, that means that each growing season when our farmers plant and each harvest season, it is fundamentally an incremental chance for them to get it right because they are truly living the real realities of climate change. Increasingly, we over the last eight out of 10 harvest seasons, our farm, uh, we have seen extreme and episodic events. You know, our, our food system, we did have a health crisis last year. We did not see, we saw our food system break, uh, bend, but not break. At the same time, we saw a derecho, an inland hurricane wipe out between nine and 10% of our American corn crop. The land in which we grow food, as we see that in the last thing I was fascinated because we are also losing eight, 83 acres of farmland an hour due to urban encroachment. And those farmlands, the way I look at it, is that is like our flyways, our ability to sequester carbon and our ability to produce food and nourishment particularly for a growing nation and growing world. And then of course, there's the real economic reality of farming where our US farmers are receiving 14.3 cents for every dollar and are weathering the face of climate change. In fact, many of our farmers will say that mental health and stress is one of their top three concerns related to the financial and weather burdens and episodic events that are outside of their control. So the ability to grow food is complicated. Um, the diversity of our biological food system, if we imagine this next level of innovation, every acre and every farmer is gonna count. We're gonna have to be able to sequester the soil out of the, out of the air 
And I'll say, I always say this, that brown and green things are the cool things. You know, I know we talk a lot about Elon Musk and these other machines that can be um, able to sequester carbon, but the, really the proven mechanism right now is a plant and some soils, and I would say some of our water. It is on these lands that we also see about 20,000 different soil types and 13 different growing zones and 21 hydrologic zones. So the ability to grow food in the face of climate change is an incredible challenge. But what gets me excited is that ag can, green things, plants can, soil can. We are currently sequestering under our feet 100 times more carbon than is currently emitted in the air. That way, another way to look at that is that's our saving banks for our grandchildren. Um, that we are cycling carbon out of the atmosphere. So agriculture's footprint, well, we're gonna hear a lot about handprints, is about 9.9%. So that's the emissions that are going up into the air. It is green carbon though, it's carbon devised, derived from the sun and through the process of photosynthesis through our land, our soil and our animals, it is cycled. Very different than fossil fuel derived or black carbon that's old carbon that's been stored under the ground for centuries. Our farmers have actually been on a pathway to reduce their carbon footprint. And uh, with current projections, with their current innovations, what they're doing every day on, on the farms, we're likely to have our carbon footprint. But what gets me super excited is that with innovation of technology that's currently here, and so I love that idea of 1938, with innovation that's currently here, and with investment and deployment of that innovation, we could be minus 4% net negative carbon. I mean, we'd be the one sector that can not only reduce its footprint, but start to have a handprint. And what gets me also excited is people. There are many organizations, many companies, and many sectors that are setting goals, but you have to bet on a sector of people who could go get it done. And 15% of the American workforce is connected to food and agriculture. And I truly believe that putting our strengths to work can be a force for climate. I get excited when I think about land, air, water, these things that we care about, because 48% of the land mess in the United States is in the hands of 2 million farmers. That is where 70% of all water is managed in the United States and 90% of all rain and snow fall on these lands. It is these people that we are counting on to be climate warriors over the next 30 years. It is going to take unprecedented change and innovation. This level of being able to provide for and nourish and grow things from our lands in the face of climate change is probably the greatest challenge that we are not talking about, not unlike going to the moon or traversing the ocean for the first time. So I'm gonna play a little film. To be honest, I don't know where to start. I was six when I knew what I wanted to be. You're only two now, but sometimes I swear I can already see it in your eyes. It was your granddad who got me into it. Put me in charge of my own acreage at 16. Boy, I had so many ideas. Heck, I was pretty confident about what I was doing. The innovations truly becoming more and more sustainable. I felt like I was on a mission. And if I'm really honest, I still can't fully wrap my head around how it didn't work. But now we're here at a point where continuing just doesn't make sense anymore. Your mother and I are selling the farm, every single acre. We talked to the bank and the realtor, it's going up tomorrow morning. And we, well, we're just going to move to the city because it'll be a brighter future. And I want you to understand why. 
It's not just the drought getting worse every year. We were working to stay ahead of that, but costs keep running up and prices keep going down. Then one day you wake up in a place where one bad season can knock you and everyone you care about right over. And that's not a good place. I worry about how much we've invested out here. And at the same time, I can't help but think about what that investment brought us. It used to be nothing but desert here and now there's so much potential in the soil. But it seems like nobody cares. And that's why we're leaving. I don't want to plant a dream in you only for you to find out later that it's not a living. And that people don't understand or worse, they don't care. They just blame everything on you. And you, you start losing your pride. And that's no life. The farm is everything to me. And I want you to know that. But my family means even more. So everything that I do in the end, it's got to be for you. Something to debate over climate change. Does agriculture have a seat at the table? And are we a part of the problem or part of the solution? Oh my gosh, I think that we are the solution to climate change. We have not had the conversation that we actually can offset carbon from the fossil fuel sector. And we are cycling carbon. We are biogenic carbon. Very, very different from fossil fuel based carbon. The potential answer to a lot of our issues is right beneath us in the soil. We've been farming for centuries and we're just now really learning about the ability of the soil to not only hold water and nutrients but also sequester carbon and improve our environment. I'm inspired every day by our peers. We monitor our soils with GPS and we know to the point how to manage our soils. It's really something, isn't it? Holding capacity, increase crop productivity, and increase carbon <laughs> sequestration. The superheroes. Our time is now, but we only have about 30 harvest cycles left to get it right. That is more important now than ever. I see the future is bright. We focus every day. Let's go home. Yeah. It's a very exciting time to be in farming because we will be one of the first industries to have a negative carbon footprint. So um, you can see <laughs> that Jay is didn't give up, and it's a real story. Um, his daughter is actually named Harvest. Um, and two weeks after filming uh, this, putting his life story on the line, um, he was hit, two tornadoes hit down and touched on his um, farm. Megan Kaiser, the farmer um, that's um, in, the, in the film, um, also three weeks, I think no farmer's gonna get on film for me again, um, was impacted by the Mississippi flooding that did not recede uh, until April. So this is real, um, what many of our farmers are facing. And just we're creating, we're creating a call to action um, on the decade of ag. So we fundamentally believe what we do now matters. And um, the decade of ag is a common vision calling on all leaders um, and individuals, if you're interested, to put your strengths to work. 
Um, over two years, we worked with the food uh, ag CEOs to, to say, what can we do to mobilize unmatched um, sector support and put farmers and ranchers truly at the center of the climate change discussion with the goal to build upon an investment. Um, this is the, um, sorry, missing my slide. So the vision is there. We've also launched three big action tracks. I won't get into those today, but we encourage you really to just get involved if you know others um, that can support. Um, this is a sector that is going to be on the front lines um, of, of climate change and is the one sector that can also go fix it. Um, we are key to the transition to a net zero economy. There's a lot of great work that needs to be done. So thank you. And I'll turn it over to you, Sam. Okay. Wow, was that powerful. And um, uh, so first off, uh, just thanks um, for the invitation to join everybody today. And thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, the um, I'll go ahead and, and share my screen and, uh, and, uh, and take us into... Um, you know, an, another layer of this discussion, right, that um, uh, around innovation, right? I love the framing of this um, of this workshop, right, that it's certainly about creating a more sustainable society. But the way to get there uh, in a lot of people's minds is through inspired thinking, innovation, and entrepreneurial spirit, right, which, which just sort of screams optimism, right? And uh, uh, you know, whether we're talking about the built environment, which, uh, uh, which Bob talked about, uh, or the, you know, the story of the farmer. And, uh, you know, there are some pretty wicked challenges that we face, right? I mean, right uh, uh, a few miles up the road from, uh, uh, from South Bend in Benton Harbor, we have another infrastructure issue around, de you know, degrading water uh, technology that is uh, you know, it's creating dangerous conditions. And, uh, and you know, the, the idea of just, uh, there's nobody that works harder than farmers. I think that's uh, uh, pretty clear. But they're always living on the edge, and they have been for generations. And, uh, and it can seem like this is a, uh, a, a, a global challenge that is just overwhelming. But I love this quote, right? Peter Drucker, who was a who was a management uh, thinker, right? One of the great uh, thinkers in business strategy, and uh, and he looked at this, and and he, you know, again, this isn't something that is just fresh, like we we uh, discovered this post -pan pandemic. This is this is a philosophy that's been uh, around for a while. Is that all of these global challenges, these wicked problems that we face, are really just opportunities, screaming. Over here, look over here, innovate here. And, uh, and I think that is a framing lens that really enables this optimism uh, and excitement and, uh, and, and creative energy that I wanna talk about today, right? And uh, so let's go ahead and, uh, and look at the, uh, the challenge of sustainability. Uh, you know, I mean, let, let's be honest. Um, uh, the the sustainability challenge is no longer some uncertain future issue that may or may not arise. We're living it, right? Climate change is here. Uh, um, you know, uh, global poverty and inequality and all of these uh, aspects they're here, and they you know we need solutions and uh, and certainly there's a, a big role for for governments to play and NGOs, right? The uh, the nonprofits and the World Bank and the United Nations and others. But I would argue that there's nobody better suited uh, to lead the, the way forward than business. And, uh, and so we look at this, this triple bottom line model that you guys are all familiar with, right? And, uh, and certainly if you run a business, whether you're you know, a, a farmer or a, or a manufacturer or anywhere up and down the value chain, the idea that you have to uh, make ends meet, right? You have to aim towards creating at least a small economic surplus to reinvest, uh, to take care of your employees and, uh, and, uh, and innovate for, for the, you know, future uh, products for your, for your, um, your customers and, uh, and other stakeholders. But this idea of having a triple bottom line uh, value proposition that either, you know, delivers, uh, you know, social benefits or environmental benefits along with 
the economic uh, uh, business model that allows you to to you know stick around and uh, and and maybe sometimes all three of them overlap and and those sweet spots are really where we aim and for a long time when we started talking about sustainability the lens was one of footprints right and uh, and we heard the word footprint on in both of the other presentations and. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, that the you know the uh, the making of things, whether you're growing food or you're providing power or you're delivering healthcare or you're or, or you're manufacturing uh, you know electronics, there's there's opportunity to eliminate waste and reduce your uh, you know your energy footprint and your transportation footprint and certainly your carbon footprint and. And everyone's been working at that, right? And we've made great progress, and and we need to continue with efficiencies and uh, and squeezing out waste. But the you know it's it's a it's a heavy lift, right? That you you can't really get to zero. And uh, you know uh, Bill McDonough from the um, uh, you know the cradle to grave uh, or the the, cra um, the uh, cradle to cradle uh, thought process may, makes the point that. You know, if if you're trying to drive south to Mexico, but you're heading north at 100 miles an hour, if you slow down to 50 miles an hour, you're still going to end up in Canada, right? And uh, and and that's where you get this this frustration and this and this burden that that uh, um, that that draws the energy, this creative spirit and entrepreneurial energy out of the system. And there's a new way of looking at this that that I'm a huge fan of that says rather than focusing on squeezing out waste and inefficiency and minimizing our footprint, which, well, let's face it, you know, boot prints in the garden are still harmful, right? Even if they're smaller boots. And, but handprints, on the other hand, healing hands laid upon the, you know, the, the, the system that is in peril generate well-being. And, uh, and we, and we suddenly flip the lens from one of scarcity to one of abundance. And we start asking questions about what can we do more of to heal this system and, and not, just, not just heal what's broken, right? But make it regenerative. And, uh, and I think that's a really exciting lens and it, and it fits with the, uh, the way that this workshop has been set up around inspired thinking, innovation and entrepreneurial spirit. And so, uh, it's a, it's a it's a mindset uh, and one that I think is really powerful. Let's look at some examples just to show you uh, what uh, what this looks like in practice. So uh, there was a um, uh, a small group of Notre Dame undergrads who, at the end of the semester, you know, you finish your finals and it's a it's a ritual that you take your textbooks. And you march back down to the bookstore, and you you sell your books, and they give you you know uh, a fraction on the dollar for what you paid for them, uh, but it puts them back on the shelf, and uh, and it gives you a little bit of pizza money uh, for the end of the semester. And uh, so these two, uh, uh, actually three, Notre Dame undergrads went down to the bookstore with their books, and and they, you know they got the message, hey. Uh, uh, yeah, that's the uh, fourth edition of this accounting book. Uh, next year, we're using the fifth edition, so we can't offer you any for that. And uh, same with your history book. And and uh, and they ended up not being able to sell their books. And uh, go ahead and, and put them on the stack over there, and you know we'll take them uh, and we'll recycle them so they'll so we can minimize the footprint. And so these guys went back to the. Uh, to the dorm, to the residence hall, and they were frustrated. They were angry, like, "What the heck?" Uh, but then they they started thinking. You know, this is a this is an opportunity, screaming for innovation, and uh, and so their initial thought process was, "How can we take these uh, books and keep them out of the landfill?" Um, but let's take a look at their story. What is the value of a book? A book can inspire a career. It can transcend boundaries. It can help start a movement. And yet every year, over one billion books end up in landfills. 
while hundreds of millions of people who want books don't have them. Like most college students, we hope to someday change the world and still make a decent living. We found a way to do both by getting the most value out of every book. As Notre Dame undergraduates, Xavier Helgeson and Christopher Fuchs dreamed up Better World Books, a for-profit social enterprise that collects used books and sells them online. Founded in 2002 with seed money from Notre Dame's social venture plan competition, the company has converted over 30 million books into more than $8 million of funding for education and literacy programs worldwide. From our initial business plan to where we are today, Notre Dame has been instrumental every step of the way. It gave us access to a network of investors, mentors, and future executives that helped us build something much bigger than we ever could have built by ourselves. Better World Books is the kind of company that we like to develop. Notre Dame wants to build value, more than just financial value, but value for mankind. Ultimately, our success is a direct reflection of the fact that most people feel the same way we do. They want to do more with their purchases. They want to know that they can change the world. The University of Notre Dame asks, what would you fight for? Fighting to bring books to the world. We are Fighting Irish. Okay, and I mean, that all started by changing the framing lens away from how do we minimize the landfill footprint or the, uh, or the, you know, the recycling burden of, uh, of these unusable books. Well, there was nothing wrong with those books. And, uh, and, uh, and Xavier and Kreese looked at that challenge and they said, there are billions of people who crave knowledge. They crave literacy. They and, uh, and, and it's not just literacy that leads to knowledge, it's the empowerment and the opportunity and the, uh, and the life-changing behavior uh, that is created by not making the paper the stuff was printed on available, but making the, the insights and the knowledge and the wisdom in those books available. And oh, by the way, this is a for-profit enterprise that earns more than its costs are every year, tens of millions of books, tens of millions of dollars in revenue year after year on four continents, self-sustaining, going into their second decade. That's handprints at work. And I, I just think that's such a powerful example. Let's look at another example. Um, so, um, Another Notre Dame uh, alum, and they, these are people that I know. They're in my network, right? I I, I work in the entrepreneurship uh, lab here in, in you know on campus at Notre Dame, so those are my examples. But they're all over the place. But so here is a uh, a guy by the name of Scott James, who was a uh, uh, Microsoft exec. He was working out in uh, um, in uh, Washington State at Microsoft headquarters. He was in the marketing department. He was on the escalator going up on a company that was, uh, that was getting things done. And uh, here was a guy whose future was, was pretty well taken care of uh, uh, based on, you know, the career trajectory that he was on. And, uh, and as a, you know, um, a consequence of uh, something that happened in his life, he and his wife had their first child. And, uh, as he was sitting there uh, holding his, you know, his newborn baby, uh, a thought went through his mind. And he said, um, you know, uh, at some point, I'm going to have to answer the question, Dad, what is it that you do uh, to, you know, to make this world a better place? And, you know, the answer of, well, I'm a software executive uh, and really highly paid just didn't seem to work in that new framing lens. And so uh, very boldly, he got off that escalator going up and, and decided that it, there, there was more to life than that. And so now what are you gonna do, right? And uh, so he looked around for opportunities and he had this you know, sustainability mindset and, uh, and was looking for opportunities to uh, essentially reduce footprints. And, uh, and he uh, sort of stumbled across this, uh, this opportunity zone that was 
the manufacturing of soccer balls. Millions and millions and millions of these are made every year with a heavy uh, environmental footprint, right? There's two, two components of a soccer ball. There's the internal bladder. It's made out of natural rubber, which is uh, um, you know, made in the rainforests and, uh, and very unsustainably uh, harvested. And then there are the hides, right? The, the leather skin on the outside that gives it the durable performance. And again, uh, you know, uh, a, um, uh, a heavy uh, footprint in terms of water usage and carbon uh, and, and et cetera. And so we set out like, well, you know what, maybe I can find a way to get fair trade uh, certified and, you know, work to, uh, to improve the, the greenhouse gas and the water and the, and the land footprints. And then you really started to dig in and you realized that there was an entire other layer to the sustainability challenge with this particular product category. And that was the way that they're made, where the way these soccer balls are made. And, uh, and the reality, the harsh reality is that most of these uh, soccer balls are produced in, um, uh, in the developing world by women uh, laborers who are underpaid with horrible working conditions and not much hope uh, to, to make a better life. And now he started to realize, wow, this is where I can really change the game. Uh, and so after getting the pieces in place for the fair trade certification on the raw materials, he got to work on the, on the labor challenge and, uh, and you know, offered a, a living wage with an education stipend and health benefits and all of the things that we take for granted uh, in a lot of our lives here. Um, and now he faced a challenge. How am I possibly going to sell these soccer balls against the big guys that are out there with lower costs and, and bigger scale? And the handprint mentality hit him uh, like, a, like a, a bolt of lightning, right? He, he realized that this is not a question of how do we reduce uh, our labor, um, uh, harmful labor footprint or our uh, rainforest uh, destruction footprint or those sorts of things. This was a question of how do we make this a teaching moment uh, to educate a, an army of young uh, warriors around the, the need for this sustainable product to be in the market. And, uh, and so he branded these soccer balls with the word respect. And by putting the word respect on it, it changed everything, right? That the coaches or the teachers are going to take these soccer balls and they're gonna give them to their players or their students. Uh, and the, these young students whose, whose eyes are this wide open and their minds are even more wide open are going to look at that and say, Coach, I, I, know, I know what that word is, right? I can read that. That says respect. But, Coach, why does the soccer ball say respect on it? And all of a sudden, this story takes hold, right, that it's changing the lives of kids your age in another part of the world who had no hope of having, you know, a healthy diet or uh, basic health care or, you know, a warm bed to sleep in. And, and, then, and then those kids go home and they say, hey, mom and dad, I got to tell you about what it says on our soccer ball. It says respect. And why does it say that? And, and all of a sudden, this becomes not a question of how do we reduce the, you know, the greenhouse gas emissions or the, or the rainforest destruction or all of those sorts of things, or even how do we, uh, you know, um, uh, eliminate the, uh, the, the labor issues, but rather how do we empower an entire uh, uh, level of society with the respect that puts them in a place uh, for a better life? And think about that. If you were at one of the big soccer ball companies uh, and you could basically underprice this guy and, and run them out of the market so fast they wouldn't know what hit them, What's your answer to that value proposition, right? Because it has nothing to do with the price of the soccer ball at that level, right? And, and what soccer league in the, in the country would say, you know, well, we, we don't want to pay a couple of extra bucks for that, right? It didn't happen. And uh, handprints uh, were, the, were the very essence of that business model. And uh, so a company, a global company called Senda said, you know, we want to take that and scale it out across our, uh, our value chain. And they, and they bought... Um, 
uh, fair trade support. So uh, that's example number two. Let me show you another example. So uh, a recent MBA student, here's a fourth generation farmer, right from California, a produce farmer uh, that, that is, you know, uh, growing up on his great grandfather's farm uh, and fighting the same battles that, that every farmer faces every day. And, uh, uh, and one of the things that he sees is that there's this waste, right? That all of these uh, um, uh, perfectly good, nutritious farm products don't make their way into the supermarket because they're not the right size or they're a weird shape, or maybe they have a bruise on one side. And, uh, and so what do the farmers do? They dump them, they compost them, millions and millions of pounds of these things every year. And it drove Ben more crazy. And so uh, he set off to get an MBA degree to figure out a way uh, to, to change that situation. And he started a company. This is a company that is up and running. Uh, it is called the Ugly Company. And what they do is they take this ugly produce that you won't find at Whole Foods because it's too ugly, that people will move that one aside to get to the more attractive uh, one, uh, you know, peaches or, or um, whatever. And he processes them into dehydrated, healthy, organic uh, uh, fruit snacks and pride, pr proudly br uh, brands them as ugly, right? And again, handprints, how can we do more of this to provide these healthy snacks uh, alongside of the you know, the fried snacks and the sugary snacks and all that are leading to, uh, to other footprints around diabetes and obesity and et cetera, and doing it in a way that takes stuff that was headed for the trash heap, right? His, his input costs are approaching zero because it was heading uh, for the compost pile and turning it into a premium product at a profit. Let me give you one more example, right? Another, another uh, uh, former student, and uh, so here's a guy, Jordan Karcher, uh, was a you know a, um, a Notre Dame business student who could have gone anywhere. He could have gone uh, into consulting. He could have gone into investment banking. He could have gone into any of the high ticket uh, places that uh, uh, that business students have the opportunity to go to. Uh, but he, he wanted more out of life. And so uh, one of the things that happened to him uh, while he was um, uh, uh, a student was he came across a, uh, a pet rescue uh, event, right? To where they were having an adoption drive for abandoned dogs. And, uh, and he met his co-founder, Molly, uh, who you can see in the photo here. Uh, and uh, and it changed his whole worldview, right? Not just about having a pet and, you know, and all the joy that it can bring, but about the reality of these uh, shelters that have to euthanize so many uh, pets that, that just had bad luck, right? And so he's starting to think, well, how can I help in that regard? And so he, uh, he also was a big, you know, coffee advocate. He loved coffee. And so he came up with this concept of grounds and hounds where 20% uh, of the profits for every pound of coffee sold goes as a donation to no kill shelters. And, uh, and he, uh, you know, he, he started this company from the ground up in his, you know, in his uh, third bedroom, he spent his Saturdays volunteering at various shelters, cleaning out the cages and doing that sort of thing. Uh, and during the week, he sold coffee, and uh, and he came up with a uh, direct to consumer subscription based business model that in 2021 is going to generate 15 million dollars in sales in coffee. And uh, and the thing about this is that it's not just uh, that he came up with this innovative concept that is profitable and is helping the planet in, in this handprints approach. But he did so into a sector that is mature with super powerful incumbents with deep pockets. I mean, we're talking about Starbucks uh, and Folgers and, and Duncan and all of the others. And he's uh, um, uh, racing up the, uh, the growth curve, $15 million in sales uh, around this idea. And, and again, the value proposition has nothing to do with the uh, the, the cost of the coffee, right? It's, their, their coffee is about 20% more expensive 
but he's selling, you know, the joy of puppies. And and how do you how do you compete with that, right? Starbucks doesn't, uh, and 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 Duncan doesn't handprints. And so, so now we get back to the wicked challenges, right? And you know, you guys are all aware of uh, you know the the myriad of uh, challenges and and problems and global issues that we face. Uh, on the environmental side, on the societal side, on the uh, on the um, you know the 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 full spectrum of the seventeen sustainable development goals, and uh, and the idea here is how can we take these challenges and flip the lens away from footprints. Right, clean water. Well, pollute the water less. Right, uh, uh, reduce your harmful emissions from ten parts per billion to five parts per billion. That's better. Put it in your sustainability report. Well, that's not good enough because I don't want five parts per billion. Right, flip the lens and make it a hand prints approach. So let me give you one more example. And uh, so certainly, climate change is at the you know the forefront of of everyone's list of global challenges. Right, and and it comes from the you know the the amongst other things, the burning of uh, fossil fuels. And uh, and so the question is, well, how do we do less of that, right? How do we reduce our footprint? And so here is a uh, uh, an example of a, uh, a company out of California, right? A couple of young guys that started a company based on an idea. Let's watch it. Behind these doors, there's a revolution where greenhouse gases are being transformed into the products that you and I buy every day. This is New Light Technologies in Costa Mesa, Orange County. Mark Harima is its CEO. We would like to fundamentally change how we're making plastics, where we're actually doing it as a tool for good. New Light uses methane gas collected from farms and landfills. It's a greenhouse gas 23 times more potent than carbon dioxide. That's right. They're turning pollution that causes global warming into plastic. The whole company started when I read a newspaper article about methane emissions from cows. And you start to realize that those emissions, you basically just have the equivalent of open natural gas pipes just gushing into the air. So after I read this article, started working through different ideas, called up my buddy, Kenton Kimmel, said, hey, I want to talk to you about something. Come meet me at Las Galandrinas. So we sat there and had burritos and said, you want to you want to tackle this thing? He said, "Sure, why not?" We had no idea the 11-year journey that lay ahead of us. You may think it's too good to be true, but here I am sitting on the proof. This chair is made from air carbon, a material that's doing its part to protect the Earth's ever-warming climate. So how do they do it? This is our main polymerization reactor. Okay. So what's happening here is we have air and methane emissions going into the tank. Okay. And this tank is essentially filled with water. As those gases travel through the water, the enzymes grab one part onto air, one part onto the methane emissions, and combine them into a polymer. I see, so it goes from gas to solid in this tank. Right here. You put in all the raw materials and nature does the rest. Exactly. The next step is to remove water from the mixture until it forms a powder. So this is a um, sort of purified in powder form. Can I touch this? Absolutely. Is it safe? This polymer is actually produced in your body and my body right now. So your body actually won't reject it, it seizes as its own. Oh cool, so downstream you may be able to make materials like prosthetics out of this. Absolutely. Okay, so again, the idea here is the framing lens that started this, right? That we, you know, they said the word pollution multiple times there and we view carbon emissions as pollution, but nature doesn't view it as pollution, right? If you're the rainforest, Carbon is 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 what you breathe in, right? It's your food source, and uh, and in that context, carbon isn't a bad thing. It just needs to be cycled properly. And so they came up with a concept again uh, over burritos uh, at their favorite Mexican place, and uh, and came up with an idea of how can we breathe in that the, those um, uh, greenhouse gases, right? Methane and, and CO2 and others, and use a natural process like the way that nature does to turn it into sugars and, and, uh, and, um, and other uh, building blocks, right? That, uh, you know, nature turns it into, into cellulose. It turns it into trees and, uh, and it's, et cetera, right? And 
So the idea here is uh, that to take the greenhouse gases, blend them with the air, run them through a process and create plastics and, and other sorts of materials that we use in, uh, in our built environment, in our consumption, and to a certain extent, even in our uh, nutrition space. And, and if you ask the question that way, then it doesn't become a question of reducing the amount of plastic we use or the amount of, uh, of agricultural methane. It becomes a question of how can we capture more of it and turn it into useful stuff the way nature does. And so the final step oops. is turning the material. So the idea here is looking at these sustainable development goals, these, these wicked challenges that are surrounding us and, and, and making us feel like we just uh, are um, overwhelmed. How can we take those and switch the lens, change the question we ask from one of scarcity to one of abundance to uh, from not one of being less bad but one of being more good. And so that's that's the story. And I think it's just, uh, the, there's a new generation of innovators, right? I mean, you go back to the framing, right? Of inspired thinking, innovation and entrepreneurial spirit. And lo look at the uh, the uh, the examples there and and then look at the, uh, the next generation of innovators that are coming up. I think it's a really exciting time for innovation. So that's, what I have, everybody. Thanks so much. My contact info uh, is uh, is here at Notre Dame. If anybody has a question, uh, please feel free to reach out. And uh, so that's my uh, pitch. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Bob. I think you're going to quarterback the Q&A, Bob. Yeah, I think that was the game plan. So uh, we'd be happy to have folks uh, send us some uh, chat uh, questions. And I think uh, Hannah can help us with those running through some of those as well. <clears throat> so it's a wide ranging set of presentations, uh, certainly talking about the wholeness of the issues and the uh, challenges that we're all uh, facing as a collective uh, group of humanity. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, are there though. Yeah, there go ahead, Hannah. Great There's great questions in here, I think already, Bob. I made a few Good. of my own. <laughs> Good, okay, fire <laughs> we away. Going through. Um, and this first one, I think, actually is more for you. Um, is it possible to see LEED and WELL on the same building? Yes, totally. LEED is uh, mostly focused on the construction of the building and its uh, operational performance uh, over time when the sun shines through the windows and heats the space and such. Uh, well is more focused on the occupants and their, uh, not only their nutrition, because uh, in a well-designed well facility, uh, there would be places to eat uh, certified organic fruits and vegetables and uh, there are all manner of things that are uh, programmatically included in the design of the facility to, uh, to align with the uh, maintenance of human health. So uh, the occupant focus, which is mostly what well is about, fits nicely with the building focus, which mostly is what lead is about. So That's yes, really they can go together. Yep. Very good. Uh, just sort of a follow-up to that, are buildings trying to retrofit to align with these concept or ideas, or does it need to be brand new build? No, uh, the uh, biggest opportunity we have in the future is retrofitting all the existing building stock. Um, if you look at the numbers of how many new buildings are likely to be constructed compared to how many that already exist, it's the retrofit that's the goal and opportunity. And so LEED and WELL can be applied to and used to design for retrofits of existing buildings. Uh, LEED has EBOM, Existing Building Operate and Operation and Maintenance, which is a scoring system for LEED. Um, WELL is looking at the humans in the space. So uh, you take an old building and uh, retrofit it properly. There are stories uh, going back, in fact, to one of my alma maters that an older building on campus got re renovated. People moved out temporarily, then they came back into their offices and they started getting sick. There was sick building syndrome and building related illness that started arising. And it had to do with two things, the materials used to finish out the spaces because they were outgassing nasty stuff. And it had to do with the cleaning products that were used to clean these unusual materials. 
So in, in the case of the cleaning products, they also were outgassing nasty stuff. And so folks were getting sick while they were there that day and they go home at night, they'd feel better. So that was just building related illness. When I'm in the building, I don't feel great. When I go home, I'm healthy. Building, uh, sick building syndrome though, is, I, I got them backwards. Sick building syndrome is in fact, uh, when uh, the, the buildings cause discomfort during the day. Building related illness is long-term. So you go to work in a place, you leave it, <clears throat> And your body has been so transformed by what it's experienced that it's not going to come back to a state of health. And so that's an illness that's propagated by the nastiness of the occupant facility. So whether it's a temporary thing or a long-term thing, it can be mitigated with proper material use and um, proper maintenance practices. Interesting. That in itself sounds like a very lucrative opportunity yes, indeed. <laughs> in the yeah. construction yeah. world. Uh, actually, this there's another another question here that I'm going to pitch it to Aaron first, but I think either one of you could probably allude to this piece. The question is, how can or does architecture innovation um, be used to help farming, like living stock space, indoor growing space? And I know just from my own small like dairy farming perspective, I have seen how some of that has happened and how they care for their animals. So I'll start with Aaron and then we can see if we're, yep. Bob has additional. Yep. And I think that's exactly right. We, we know that our animals are uh, daylight and the types of lighting that definitely affects the productivity of those animals. Um, the spacing, you know, I think there's this whole field that has emerged in the last 10 years just in animal agriculture, just on barns and housing. So it's interesting when you use the phrase bio, biophilic, I'm like, I, I feel like in ag we've been doing this and just um, seeing this idea as well of this idea of giving back that next level. So we've really done a good job of taking care of the animals in the barn, but then the question I, I would have is, that I haven't seen is how, would it, how could it even contribute more? I've seen some of our farmers that have put um, solar panels on those roofs and those designs, but I don't know, I'd be curious if you've seen anything in agriculture yeah, well, there are a couple of things, the three things to talk about. One is that the, uh, you know, placing solar panels on a building to produce electricity locally means that you've got less carbon going into the atmosphere from burning coal, for example. So that's a net positive for everybody. Uh, that electricity is generated locally and it's occurring whenever the sun is out. So even if you have a nasty storm or a flood or whatever, uh, the next day if the sun's out, you've got electrical power. You can recharge your phone even though, um, the electric grid might be down. You can turn on your flat screen and see what's going on in the world. So that aspect of in integrating solar production with the farm is a useful thing. Now there's a rule of thumb, which is if you take an acre of land and you grow a crop, you get 100% productivity out of that. If you cover that same land with a, an electrical production field, solar panels, you get 100% electricity. But if you do both, you get 80% of each, which is 160% productivity. So you can actually have sheep grazing under a solar array for electrical production. So hybrid integrated architecture of sorts is starting to find its way into the farming area. And that's a great example. Uh, the, the other thing to make a comment about is that uh, animals are not so different than people. They breathe, <laughs> they eat. Um, they can have levels of comfort or stress, as you mentioned. And so uh, anything you can do to enhance that experience uh, will, as you just mentioned, improve productivity. One of the things that's being discovered is that factory farming, which tends to constrain and uh, stress animals, is not as long-term productive and certainly not as good for the planet as uh, paddock farming, where you rotate your animals from one field to another, give the field time to come back, let them naturally graze on grasses and such. And you can actually plant materials that uh, they particularly love to eat. So, um, and there are farmers doing this. They've gone from the fossil fuel based supported agriculture production to sustainably based, more naturally uh, compatible production. And they have a, healthier livestock and healthier plant life that comes out of it. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I have another question in here, actually. And I, 
I think maybe this comes back for Sam. I don't know if you'll know the answer to this. It may be one that we need to do some more research on. Um, there was a question, I'm just wondering if the initiatives dealing with the unsellable produce, so like the ugly fruit company that you had mentioned, um, that she'd heard that there was some backlash for some companies doing that because it actually reduced the amount of food that was donated to pantries or homeless shelters and, and things like that. Um, so it was just like a curiosity question. I know from my perspective, I've I've heard both sides on the dietitian space. I didn't know if you'd heard anything from your example or not. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it's a really important question. And, uh, you know, the idea of unintended consequences. Um, uh, there are lots of examples of companies donating, um, you know, out of date inventory of shoes or, or jackets or, or whatever down into the villages of the, of the developing world. And on the surface, it's like, okay, all of these people now have something they didn't have, but all of the craftsmen uh, and merchants that had been selling and, and making and, uh, and serving those markets are suddenly out of business, right? And so we certainly want to take a, uh, an inclusive approach uh, with that. And um, generally speaking, uh, I think it's, it's, it's a challenge that needs to be brought to those innovators, to those entrepreneurs, but I think they absolutely embrace it, right? That, uh, you know, Ben Moore, uh, if, if he was approached by those stakeholders, would probably say, let's get them in the same room and figure out how we can, you know, um, more, put more handprints on this because we've got more food here than we can possibly use, but you have to do it. You have to be intentional about it. And uh, and and recognize that it's not just a thank goodness we're here sort of uh, world, right? That there's there's lots and lots of ripple effects and, and unexpected consequences that you have to be aware of, right? And uh, um, and and be careful that you don't make a situation worse with your with your good intentions. So that's a great question. Thanks for bringing that up. Sure, sure. And I personally would probably even reach out to our friends at Feeding America, like, has there been a study? Because I think there's a space for everybody in this. We truly, as you mentioned, Sam, have more food in some aspects in this country than we can even handle in some spaces. And it's getting it to the appropriate space in a way that's, you know, ethical, that is... Uh, consumable by that particular group, whether they enjoy it or religious beliefs and all of those things. And, you know, I consider that even when I, when I look at farming and um, our practices there, you know, big farm, small farm, organic farm, conventional farm, there's space for all of them. And we just have to communicate to be able to, to make sure that, you know, we, we do put our hands in as many places as possible. I have one last question because I know we are running out of time here, um, but I have a question that says, what is one action step um, for professionals that um, you as speakers can leave us with so that we can help put more handprints on our community? I'll start with um, Sam. You got a thought? Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> did I see that question it was from Jenny? Yeah, it was. <laughs> All right, congratulations, Jenny, on your on your new uh, your new gig, and uh, uh, great question, right? Um, you know, I, I'm going to refer back to my uh, first slide where it talked about the, you know, the the entrepreneurial spirit and the mindset and the and the um, you know this this optimism uh, that comes with this, right? That I mean, let's face it, it's a it's a challenging. Uh, moment in time to watch the news and, 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 and be engaged, right? There's just so many challenges, uh, um, not the least of which is, is you know, coming out of a, a pandemic. But if we remind ourselves that, uh, uh, that there is a lot of hope and take this, this, um, this optimistic problem solving, don't be less bad. I think Bob's uh, slide said something about, you know, building the code. Don't take that mindset, right? That the code is is the you know the minimal amount of uh, footprint that is that is permitted, but but flip the uh, the situation around, and I think you'll find it's contagious, 
right? People want to engage in that dialogue very badly, right? And, uh, and they have ideas and, uh, and you know what, some of the ideas are just going to fail because it's entrepreneurial, right? So failure is part of it, but we, we pick ourselves back up and we try again uh, and keep that, that entrepreneurial optimism uh, and, um, and it, you know, in that context, it, it, it suddenly think, well, what an exciting time to be alive, right? And uh, so, um, yeah, I guess that would be my advice. And, uh, um, you know, it's, uh, I think it's a, um, um, it's a world of opportunity. Excellent. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Aaron, how about you? Piece of advice or suggestions for us for handprints? Yeah, so I, th I think in the food and ag sector, we've long, I guess, had that deficit-based mindset, Sam. And you know, I truly do believe that this is the one sector that can be the solution and transition to a net zero economy. And that is not just from our carbon numbers, our environmental numbers, but also what we do through the people we employ and the lives we nourish. So I think really um, owning um, what's what we always get critiqued for, but understanding how to lean into those strengths, encourage anyone to actually read the decade of ag. It was carefully crafted to, to aspire to put that, a strength-based approach to ag. And like, if we could fulfill the decade of ag, we could unlock all 17 goals. If you're a individual consultant, if you're a professor or anyone, you can be your own, you can be an individual leader in the decade of ag and state you know, what your strengths are and put and, and say what you're going to aspire to in that, in that decade of ag. So just encourage you to get involved is really what we need uh, in this movement. Um, and next, next week is COP, uh, the climate change talks. Tune in. Um, you know, this is the decade of action. It was delayed due to COVID. You know, I think we all learned what we can do together as a community. Um, and now we're asking what we can do as a, as a community of people for a planet. Um, and that is really what the decade of ag, the decade of ag. So just encourage you to get involved. Perfect. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, Bob, any words of wisdom to impart us with from the agriculture sector that we can assist with? Yeah, the, uh, <clears throat> I find it helpful when talking about sustainability to use three broad terms that, uh, help me keep things organized and it can apply to the ag sector for sure. There are three words, green, sustainable, and generative. Green is a term that refers to materiality and talks a little bit to what Sam and, and Aaron both brought up about what is the sourcing of a thing? Where are you getting the materials from? How are you uh, remanufacturing or ma managing them so that you're getting the products and the purposes that you want? If you look at a room you're in right now, what materials in that room could be made from locally sourced products that uh, wouldn't require transport from around the globe? Is there a, a local manufacturer, a local supplier that could meet your needs? So what is the greenness of the materiality of your world? Um, where do you get your products? Are they recycled, downcycled, or upcycled? It's another helpful set of phrases. Sustainable is really about a balance of flow. So it's um, akin to a checkbook. Is your income and expense balanced? Are you spending more than you take in? Are you in some way managing your water flow, your energy flow, your material flow in a way that's positive? And certainly farmers in uh, years past were very good at managing those flows because they had hybrid operations. They were not monoculture industrial scale, but they were family scale and waste products were food for the pigs or food for other animals and things were cycled locally on the farm. So it was a well-balanced operation. So it's a way to think about balance of flow, income and expense. And then generative, and this is the mantra we use now in architecture, can a building give back more than it takes? Can it feed the grid? If you think about a tree, the engine on the tree is the leaf. It converts the sun's energy into uh, the cellulose fiber that Sam mentioned. The tree has benefits beyond so many board feet of lumber. It provides places for animals to live. It stabilizes the soil. It puts nitrogen back into the soil. It puts oxygen into the air. So it's hard to measure a tree as efficient. It's better to measure it as effective. 
So can we measure buildings as being effective, not just efficient? Can we talk about how they give back more than they take? And that means they become leaves on the tree, which is the grid. So can the buildings as leaves feed the grid and help humanity more generally? So that's the mantra that we try to follow in our studio teaching these days. Absolutely. Thank you for that. I, it just brings to mind actually so many other um, webinars and, and things that I have seen in the last couple of years that really just show, you know, of course, for me, it's been mostly in the nutrition and agriculture sector right. since, I, right. you know, I work for the Dairy Association. So it's really interesting to see what's been happening. Um, and maybe some pieces that I can then follow up um, with those of you that are on and attending today. Um, thank you all very much for participating. I so appreciate our panelists for all of your information. It was really, really interesting, um, and I've enjoyed it. And based on the commentary that we received in the in the uh, chat box today, I think everyone else really did too. Uh, lots of, of great pieces there, and, and kudos to all of you. Thank you to everyone who joined us. As I mentioned, um, I will make sure that I send out the recording for this. Um, as well as maybe some additional pieces, food for thought that we have um, that's kind of come about through our conversations today to make sure that you all have access to that um, or if you need to get in touch with us. Um, again, I work for the American Dairy Association Indiana um, and we work for farmers much like Erin does. Uh, so sustainability is, is truly the, the center of so much of their work in our hearts and um, it's just wonderful to be able to connect with um, the architectural aspect and the entrepreneurial aspect and really looking at ways that we can all work together to make our planet and our society more sustainable. So thank you everyone. And um, we'll hopefully see you again at another webinar soon. Indeed. Great fun. Thanks so much. Thank you guys thank so much. Thanks everybody. Thank Take you. care. I'm going to end.